Our first speaker today is Barbara King. Where's Barbara? I'm over here hiding. <laughs> okay. Just a brief introduction on Barbara. She's the Executive Director of Watersheds Canada. Barbara has worked with Watersheds Canada and its predecessor organization since 1999. As Executive Director, her role includes the development, management, and delivery of shoreline stewardship programs across Canada. Barbara has been integral in taking small, action-oriented programs into large, multi-stakeholder programs that can be launched on a national level. Barbara has recently completed a master's in nonprofit management and philanthropy at Carleton University and has an environmental management background. Barbara? Yeah, put a timer on so I don't go over it because I didn't see a clock, so right I will uh, set that up. Thank you very much. Sorry? So everybody can hear me? No. no. Okay. Uh, let's just see how we turn this on. Oh. All right. So I live on a small lake in eastern Ontario. I'm about two hours from here north. And, um, you know, I've spent my entire career working with shoreline property owners and educating them on actions that they can take to protect our lakes and rivers. Um, so it's really my passion and, and figuring out, you know, how do we change the practices that uh, are currently taking place, you know, in terms of uh, what's happening along our shorelines. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we have and the programs that we've delivered that are quite successful in working with property owners. Just curious, how many people here own property along a lake, river, obviously river where we are? Wow, okay. And I'm just curious, American side, Canadian side, start with American side. And then how many fellow Canadians do we have down here? Okay, great. And I can say, um, I should have been here over the last, you know, 10 years coming to these conferences, you know, looking back at some of the speakers that you've had, it's absolutely fantastic. And I'm honored that you brought me down and really appreciate it. So I work for an organization that has a really big name, Watersheds Canada. We sound like we're government and we do all sorts of things. We are a charitable organization. We're fairly small. We're a staff of five and we're solely focused on shoreline stewardship. Uh, and education around, you know, working with municipalities, other partners, other organizations, and landowners on giving them the tools so that they can take action. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead here, and I, I always, you know, you try to explain to people what a healthy shoreline looks like, and what does it look like underwater? You know, what's happening? So, you know, when you have a healthy shoreline, you have a lot of different um, commu vegetation communities. So a healthy shoreline will have different trees and shrubs, you might have some wetland species, you want to have some fallen logs and structure. And you know, 90% of aquatic life needs to use that shoreline environment at some point in their life. So this just kind of gives you a picture of what's happening underwater. So I'll just let you look at that. So you see lots of minnows, fish, aquatic vegetation. Um, you know, you don't see a lot of sed sedimentation, the water's not cloudy, like it's a really nice, healthy, kind of looks like an aquarium. <laughs> so, in, and that's what, you, what you'll see, and you can see the snags, you've got some fallen trees. So this is really good habitat for wildlife. And also, this shoreline also provides a lot of services. So nature takes care of itself, like in terms of helping to prevent erosion, helping, you know, in situations where you may have a lot of water. We've had a lot of flooding over the last couple of years, both on our side, your side, 2017-19, terrible, terrible flooding years. And you want to look at having resilient shorelines. So, you know, if you're thinking, think about your own property as, as we go through and, and looking at that too. How much natural habitat do you have along your shoreline? And um, are, you, are you looking like this? Or I'm going to go on to this next slide here. Um, so this is, was all these videos were taken up on White Lake by a colleague of mine. He works for Fisheries and Oceans. And he's a fantastic guy who travels all over. And he's passionate about underwater communities. So he does a lot of research. Um, so this is on the same lake. Uh, I'm going to show you this video. And this is taken on a stretch of shoreline that is developed. So highly developed. We have a lot of grass to the water's edge. 
a um, lot of uh, structures and you're just lacking that that vegetation community so this person won't be happy I don't know who they are <laughs> I hope you're not here <laughs> so and this is probably within a kilometer of the other video that was taken. So you can see a massive difference of what's happening underwater. Um, you don't see the same, you know, vegetation. It's cloudy, the sedimentation, you know, you can, everything's stirred up. So as a wave energy comes in, you don't have the same structure there to dissipate some of that. So it, it has some major impacts. Um, but I just wanted to share that just to kind of set the stage. And, and these, are, these are typical pictures of what we see you know, in Canada, and I know I've been along the St. Lawrence, both Canadian and American side of, of development. So as people come to buy property on the shorelines, they want to bring the city um, kind of mentality of development and controlling nature. Um, and so we see a lot of this. This has been fairly common in 2019. We've had a lot of issues with flooding. I'm not going to get into that because you have an amazing speaker coming up who's going to be talking about that. But you know, we've built in our floodplains. Um, you know, and, and, and I think the high water mark is changing. Um, so you know, looking at what can we do and how do we adapt to that moving forwards? Because I don't think that issue is going to be going away. Um, this riprap is the bane of my existence. <laughs> I don't know, I think it's so over-prescribed. If you have erosion on your shoreline, well, let's put some rock, and then if you have bigger water, well, then bigger rock. Actually, no, let's get into armor stone. Um, it, it's just, uh, I think we over-engineer and over, you know, we put too much structure. And what you're doing in these situations is you're sterilizing that entire shoreline environment for wildlife, you know, and the very things that we care about. So why do you guys live on the water? What are you here for? Nature? Okay, do we care about fish? Do we care about, um, you know, the birds and the fish and the wildlife and good water quality? This is not going to give you good water quality. And when you have this happening um, over and over and over again, you know, on a lake, on a river, it's like death by a thousand cuts. Now, Totally, I'm only focused on the shoreline development, but there's certainly, obviously, so many other factors. You know, we talked about invasive species, what's happening upland, you know, municipal drains, not taking that into account, but I think we, as property owners, have a huge responsibility to do our part and take action in terms of the way we manage our lands. So it's complicated. I'm not going to explain this slide because it's complicated but you know there's so many different factors property values land rights well I've always had it this way it's been 30 years my dock was never underwater well it is now things are changing how do we adapt to that you know I used to be able to jump off my dock and swim I didn't have any aquatic plants well we do we have invasive species now and there's things that are changing so we need to look at adapting the way we manage our properties and you know looking at you know uh, the bottom situation where you have grass at the water's edge and looking at ways that you can kind of take nature-based I guess nature-based um, is kind of the term that's used down here I guess so uh, I'm going to use that term nature-based what's it called nature-based restoration or yeah management nature-based management um, but really and this is actually a Minnesota book I love some of the work that came out of um, they, they've got so anyway some great resources uh, landscaping for wildlife for water quality if you don't have that book it's really well done because it gives you some really good diagrams of what you should be doing so when you have development on the shoreline um, you want to look at having vegetation <coughs> pardon me, communities, um, right from your, your development down to the water. So you want to stop the rainwater from just flowing over land directly into our water. So if you have hardened surfaces, so you've got grass, you know, whatever else, decks and docks and all your structures, you know, 55% of the rainwater just runs over land, taking with it nutrients and sediments and everything else directly into the waterway that we really care about. So you want to look at strategic planting and allowing for rainwater to infiltrate, be cleansed, purified, enter that water cycle naturally. And that's what you're looking at in stages here. So I think sometimes we only focus on the shoreline 
And um, I think we need to look up upland. So I did a presentation last year called Standing on the Dock in the Rain. And literally, that's what you should do is stand on your dock in the rain and see where the water flows and then look at things that you can do to stop it you know, from up in areas. It should be infiltrating. You should not see things coming right down overland into, into our lakes and rivers. So you can strategic planting, and these are some examples of what you can do. Um, so I'm just going to share some of the programs that we've been running. Um, so my passion is developing, you know, solutions to kind of all of this. Well, how do we work with you guys to change? Because we know that you all care about water quality. We know that people care about wildlife. They care about, they're passionate about, you know, your river, your lake. I mean, I would, you know, stand in front of somebody if they were coming into my lake, and I, I actually probably have had a few encounters with a few neighbors maybe I wish not I won't share those stories but <laughs> anyways you're passionate you want to protect your water because you care about it but what I'm seeing is a disconnect between um, people's values and their actions and that's what I think we need to do is help um, build tools and educate people on you know okay well you value all of these things these are actions that you can take to to change and do your part so we all have a part to play um, so, you know, looking at that demonstrated disconnect between values and actions, I think people need to know, you know, where to get resources. I think they need to be easy. Sometimes um, we speak the science talk um, and, you know, it doesn't really make sense. Well, what does that mean? You know, it can be so overwhelming. Well, what does that mean to me as a landowner? Um, so giving, giving information is something that's very straightforward. Um, and just eliminating barriers. So what are your barriers to changing on your property um, and taking action? So whether it be financial, um, possibly not knowing what to do, where to start, um, reaching out and giving that information. So one of the programs that we've been running, um, we're partnered with the Canadian Wildlife Federation, uh, is, it's called Love Your Lake. It doesn't mean, oh, write it off. It's not a program we could do because it says lake. <laughs> We've had a Love Your River, don't worry. But <laughs> we stupidly went ahead and branded it as Love Your Lake. And then people were like, well, what about a river? Why can't we do this on the river? So we've had Love Your River versions and, you know, our logo. We're, like, we're not, you know, too picky about that. So just pretend we're talking about Love Your River, okay? Um, so this program, we've done about 40,000 shoreline assessments across Canada. It is a package program. So the way we work as an organization is we take programs, we test them in Eastern Ontario, and if they're successful, people like them, we package them up and share them with other organizations. So we have been delivering across Canada, so they become other organizations' programs. And um, this is certainly one that would be available to both sides of the border. There's no reason um, why it couldn't be used. Uh, but we, we actually go out. It, it, it's an assessment program, an education program, where every single shoreline property owner on a given area gets a personalized property report based on what we see on your property. Um, so different people are involved. I'll just kind of skip over that because that's the boring part. Um, I'll just go straight to the assessments. <laughs> Sorry. If you're interested, I can get into the boring part. You know, we actually have agreements and, you know, all that fun stuff. So it is quite organized. Um, and we have a lot of materials. But we work with the Canadian Wildlife Federation. We come out and train summer students. So if you want to run a Love Your Lake program, we train summer students on how to do that. We have a very good protocol put together and a data sheet. Um, so we worked with scientists. Uh, a whole pile of, you know, steering committee of people who really looked at, you know, what's the best way to look at these shorelines and what kind of information can we collect about a shoreline property based on visual observations that, you know, would give us some information about what's happening, yet also allow us to be able to educate shoreline property owners. So I do have copies of the data sheet. Um, so we fill out one data sheet per property when we're out in the field. And you can do about 30 properties a day, if you're curious, so it's pretty efficient. Um, and we collect observations about erosion, about, you know, native plant communities, you know, looking at development, looking at opportunities for the landowner to take action. And we have this very complex but very cool database that when you go back to the office, so wherever you are, organization, you could be in British Columbia, you could be down here, you sign in and you can create 
uh, these customized property reports, shoreline property reports. I did bring some samples. So by filling out the data sheet, every shoreline property owner on your targeted area gets a report created for them that's personalized based on the information that we take out in the field. Um, so it's, it's been an evolving process and we just kind of launched, I think, version four uh, updates you know, in terms of the language that's used. And one thing that is missing is looking at climate change and the impacts of climate change. So we want to do another update on that. But this becomes like your little Bible of, you know, okay, you know, and people get so excited about what are we saying about my property? And they're written in a very positive way. So we want people to feel good about themselves. You know, yes, I have grass to the water's edge. I'm sure some of you guys here are going, oh gosh, I hope she doesn't come to my house. Um, but that's okay. Um, you know, what matters is that you're, you're interested in taking action and changing um, maybe the way you manage your properties because you care about the river. So this becomes a report that you have and it kind of becomes like a little bit of a coffee table book. So if you order the hard copy of it, it's twenty dollars or you get it digitally you know as soon as the assessments are over and it tells you it talks about everything from septic system management kind of the do's and don'ts shoreline erosion what native plants are available to you and and that's a great resource so i just wanted to share a little bit about that program as an opportunity um and yeah, the, we, the other part of that program is that you end up with a summary report. So we put that together. So the information that's entered into the database, we analyze it and give information back to the group. So, um, you know, kind of looking at, well, what does the data say? You know, what does this mean when you look at the, uh, the higher level of it and you think, okay, like this is just one property, two properties, three properties, but together, you know, what percentage of shoreline is developed? You know, what percent of shoreline has native vegetation? How much structure is there? And I think structure is not something we talk about enough, you know, in terms of fallen, fallen logs and trees, cavity trees and, and habitat for wildlife. Did you know that those fallen logs are critical for fish in terms of rearing and survival? They need that structure to survive. So, you know, when a tree falls on your property down in front of the water, and my dad was famous for this, a tree falls, you, you cut it because it fell into the lake. Like, it's an eyesore. My boat's going to get caught on that or something. But no, a tree falls, you leave it. It's habitat. You know, you're entitled to your one access point along your shoreline and leave the rest for nature. We do not need to. Yeah, exactly. You do not need to access the water from every single point along your shoreline. So our lakes, our rivers, our waterways are not a backyard playground. It is a living ecosystem and we need to treat it that way and change the way we look at our water. Um, so this report gives information back to the organization about these are some of the things that you should be concerned about, worried about. We've identified invasive species, we've identified um, you know, that you're really lacking in natural shoreline vegetation, there might be some options uh, or opportunities for you to go out and do some, some restoration. So, the website, if you're curious, we have a lot of resources for landowners, for organizations. Please go to the website um, if you're interested in learning more about things that you can do on your own property. It's a great resource. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, loveyourlake.ca. Just pretend there's a river in there. Don't worry. <laughs> it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> the information is just as relevant. Um, I just thought I'd briefly mention, we do have a workshop similar to this, not as well attended, and very similar that we do have it every year as well. But um, the resources from the workshop are on our website, so we have kind of uploaded all the presentations. So we have scientists and, you know, very similar uh, awesome experts that come out and, and uh, share information too. So there might be some information in that, but I'm definitely going to come back to Save the River, so I should have been here before now. So anyways, that is something 2020, we've been doing it not as long as you guys. So you guys set the stage on that. We've only been doing it for 18 years, so... 31 years is fantastic. <laughs> yes, you guys are awesome. <laughs> now this is a new resource. I will admit it's version one, it's not perfect, but um, our Lake Links uh, committee um, was really passionate. So if you're not gonna do a big program like Love Your Lake, 
is there resources out there for landowners to take, you know, look at the disconnect between their values and their actions and something that they can pick up? So we developed this lake protection workbook um, and it, it basically goes through all the best management practices for shoreline property owners and I do have boxes of them here. I, I, we do sell them for a cost at $1.50. I don't mind giving some out, but I kind of, we distribute them on, f uh, on behalf of the Lake Links Committee. Um, but uh, they, I, if you want to come look at copies, so it talks about things like, you know, talking about erosion, how shorelines function, um, just to, you know, educate uh, property owners. And then there's a checklist that you can go through to kind of rate how well am I doing. So um, you can do this in private and not share the book if you like, <laughs> which, you know, you don't want to be the red. We tried to, we, we actually argued a lot about red because uh, I think people don't like red. Um, but we, we, anyways, we ended up with green, yellow, and red. So I think people don't like to be the needs improvement. We also didn't know what to call it, you know. Um, is it needs improvement? Is that nice enough? Uh, but anyways, so you can kind of rate yourself how you're doing in the different sections, you know, in terms of recreation, lawns and gardens, shorelines, wetlands. Um, are you taking actions? And then is there things that you can do um, to change that? So I have these books down there again. And uh, another resource this is on the Canadian side. I realize you guys have different hardiness zones. Uh, what do you call them down here? Are they plant hardiness zones? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Phew! I'm good. Uh, no, we, uh, so we developed this database. We find it a little bit overwhelming, you know, trying to find information. We say, oh, here's a list of native plants that you could plant on your shoreline. And people are like, well, my shoreline is dry. Like, a, you know, the typical list was always water tolerant species. So if you have a wet shoreline, well, I planted all these dogwoods and they died. Well, that's because you should be planting sumacs or, some, well, maybe not sumacs, but uh, you've got a very dry property. So anyways, we put together just kind of a very simple database a couple of years ago where you can search and create your own list of shoreline plants. So you can go out and look at your site, where you are, plant hardiness zone, and I think it's quite relevant, um, you know, right along the St. Lawrence in terms of similar. I did look into it briefly, so we have some similar hardiness. We're very close to you, uh, <laughs> so um, it's something something to look at as a resource. But um, taking that a step further, so after Love Your Lake, we thought, okay, so landowners got really excited and they're like, I got this great resource, I got this book, I'm supposed to naturalize my shoreline, but I don't know what to do. And so we started off with the database and we're like, oh, well, you know, here's a list of plants, like, go do it. It's like, well, that's not that easy. Where do I get the plants? What do I plant? I can't do it. I'm not physically capable or, you know, different barriers. And uh, so we started a program back in 2013 called the Natural Edge. And it's evolved since then. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. Um, but it's a shoreline restoration program where we would go out, visit property owners, talk to you about, you know, what's happening on your property, give you some recommendations, and then we would create a planting plan for the property. And we used to do it by hand, <laughs> we literally. We, then we got savvy and we used Word, like Word is amazing. If you've ever used Word to draw, it's so easy. <laughs> There might be some sarcasm there, but uh, we would take a picture of the section of shoreline, measure it all out, and then like drop plants on the picture. And if you've ever tried to do that on Word, like it's, you need a lot of patience and I don't have a lot of patience. So it was kind of ridiculous and then we were doing this program and then we'd go out and plant plants for, for property owners. And so we, we, um, we came up with this idea, like, there's got to be something better. You know, like landscapers, they've got these amazing apps. You can go out and they do the design your property, but they don't use native plants. You know, you can drop in all these plants. So can we do something like that? And um, one of the person who actually funded this program, I'll just switch slides, you're probably getting bored. Uh, she's from California. And she has property up on White Lake. And uh, so we went out and did a site visit with her. And uh, she loved the program, so we restored her shoreline. And uh, her address, you know, when I was sending her something uh, in the mail was, you know, California, 90210. So I was like, Beverly Hills, come on, okay. So I'm like, mm, well, maybe she'd be interested. So I, we had dinner, and I said, you know what? 
is this something you might be interested in? She says, sure, give me a proposal. So I sent her a proposal and she just emails back, sure, I'll e email you the money. And I'm like, oh, wow, okay. So, uh, you know, we've been very lucky. She's funded the development of this entire program and software, and it's ready to be used by others across Canada, or I see no reason why it wouldn't ha work in the US too, because it's very cool. So I'm gonna show you it. So the, whoops, sorry, I'm going back. I got a little excited. Uh, I'll tell you what it is. So it's basically a program in the box, like the Love Your Lake, where we can share it with other organizations. We do deliver it in Eastern Ontario. Any landowner who gives us a call, who wants to have us come out to the site, we will go out um, to your site and work with you. So it, uh, it comes with program software. We have all the materials, communications, um, training guidebooks, program support, agreements and the database so it's kind of you know if, if you're in British Columbia or if you're here in New York you want to start your own program then we can give you all the tools to do that so we just adapt these materials with your logo they become co-branded we do ask to keep our branding um, because we you know we want to have it as sort of a this is you know a standard of what the program is um, and, and a new guidebook we just developed is the Wildflower Garden Book because I find if you're a bit of a chameleon in how you talk to shoreline property owners, so if you say, hey, would you like to plant some trees and shrubs on your shoreline? Sometimes people are like, oh, I'm a little worried about my view, but you start talking about pollinators, um, you know, and, and different things like that. They'll want you out there tomorrow to do a pollinator garden, and then you can bring in some trees and shrubs along this side. So, you know, you kind of have to present things in different ways that appeal to, to people in different ways too. So people are passionate about wildflowers. I've learned never to talk about snakes on shorelines. <laughs> I don't know why, like we pick them up and play with them, but uh, apparently snakes are not something to talk about. Turtles are okay. So we don't put snakes in any photos uh, on our stewardship material because if I say, hey, well, you're gonna get more snakes on your property. <laughs> it's, not, it's not very good. Okay, so, and this is the program brochure, so feel free, I have some out there, but we adapt it. Um, so we just piloted a new model. I've got eight minutes, so we're good, don't worry. Don't worry, I won't be too long. Um, so I'm just gonna show you how it works. So we actually use a tablet, and um, we work with a tablet and computer software. So we developed this software, so it is something that we go out and we, do a site visit with a tablet so you guys as the landowners actually design your own shoreline um, property so you pick your plants um, and we walk you through the process um, so we come out and we you know start off collecting your information right on the tablet and we do measurements and we look at areas so talk to landowners about you know what area do you use to access the water what area you know do you use and then how about this over here is this something that we could look at naturalizing kind of bringing nature back it will help with you know erosion and all sorts of other things so there's huge benefits to putting plants in the ground um, and then we also embedded in here because for our funders and probably for you guys too you need to know like we need to hear from you what do you know before you know before us coming out there about um, about your shoreline how much do you know about native plants so we have a before survey embedded into the app so we fill that out so that we can collect information and then report back to our funders as well and, and also for other groups um, so we go through and look at the site conditions we do take a shovel we look at the soil you know what kind of soil do you have um, what kind of light uh, is it dry um, looking at the depth too because you don't always have a lot of um, you might have bedrock you know different situations what can you plant and height <laughs> I find height is most important because uh, people don't necessarily want to have something really bushy and tall right in front of their viewpoint so you look at um, height you know in certain areas so this actually triggers uh, the back end of the database to show only certain plants to the landowner based on these conditions um, so we're getting the right plants and then we you go through and you actually scroll through and look at the plants with the landowner and say hey you know I love that one or for me it's like button bush that's my favorite I love the beautiful white buttons so if you can show what it's going to look like when it's mature um, you can select off so 
you know, as a landowner, you can actually pick which plants you like. Um, certain ones are not well liked, like sumac. <laughs> um, people tend to not want on their property. So this is uh, what you end up. So you would take a picture with the app of a certain area that you're going to restore, and you place the plants. And so you start to develop the planting plan um, and numbers. So you're actually placing which plants go where on the property. So this is just kind of a, an example. Um, and you outline those areas. And then you end up with different compartments. So on your property, you may have three or four different compartments with different uh, native plants. So you're working um, to develop your own planting plan. So this is your design, your plants, you've picked them. Um, and then kind of like the Love Your Lake program, I didn't bring it up here. I don't have anything to throw on the ground this time. Um, so kind of like the Love Your Lake program, then it uh, creates a planting plan based on what you've chosen. Um, and you get that planting plan. And from that, you can either purchase the plants yourself or we do the planting for people. So we kind of set it up for other organizations depending on how they want to deliver it. We just charge $5 per plant for us to plant it and a $250 starter kit fee that comes with the planting plan and 50 free plants. And then you pick up your kit, off you go. You've got your planting plan. You know where everything's going, where it's labeled. And then you have all the, the other guides to do that. So that program is available um, for other organizations. We're really excited that we've tested it. We've done two years now. We're ready to launch it. Um, to anybody who wants to run the program. So we're pretty excited about that. Sorry, I forgot this was in there. This is what's inside the planting plan. So you're looking at uh, kind of a summary of how many plants, what plants, you know, looking at uh, what zone you're in, your characteristics, and a list of plants so that you can have a look and see what they're going to look like. So, you know, you're not gonna remember. Um, and then, you know, a financial summary breakdown of, of what your cost would be you know, depending on the organization. We do have to fundraise for this, um, and, and that's always an ongoing struggle, is finding money for, for restoration. Uh, this is one of the sites that we did. Um, so this is on a river, so I picked it appropriately, uh, the Madawaska River, and they had some massive year-to-year -year flooding, um, massive amounts of erosion, and they really didn't know what to do. This was a really big project. So we came out and we did a planting plan with them and you know, came out and did planting day. Now plants, when they're dormant, you plant in the fall or the spring, they look half dead. So don't worry, they're okay. The next picture will show you more, but you know, when they're, they're dormant. So this is kind of um, after two and a half years. Um, so it's beautiful. And if you go to our website, you'll hear uh, one of their testimonials about it. So they're just so ecstatic about, you know, how beautiful their property looks now. So we did plant a lot of wildflowers um, and there were some really wet areas too. So it's just like, uh, it is an absolutely beautiful property and something that any one of you guys can do with a little bit of help. Um, so thank you. I will leave some time for questions. I think I even have two more minutes according to my timer, so I'm quite proud. Uh, I'll leave it at that. But we all, yeah, thanks. <laughs> presentation. I can already hear our board and probably Tilt's board is going to say we should be doing that. So there's a couple oh, questions right Yeah, there. I still got the mic door. <laughs> I just wonder whether you have a resource guide where to purchase these plants that are very special often. I just can't get them at the back of the garden. Yeah, Yes, so we work with um, the regional partners. So if you had somebody delivering hay on the, on the New York side, they would find the plants and only show you in your planting plan because they can make adjustments in the software, only show you what's available. There's no point in getting you excited about a plant you can't get. Um, so it would be up to the partners, yeah. There's another question back there. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it, uh, it, you're right. It's difficult because you know they don't necessarily see their impact or thinking things are coming from, you know, oh, well, it's their problem coming in. So I think it's you know a lot of education and, and going out and showing things. Like for me, visuals really impact me personally when I see what things look like and the impact you know along along my property. But yeah, it's certainly very difficult and challenging. I don't really have a good answer for that. <laughs> Uh, we would love to. We are a staff of five and that's our biggest issue. So we want to get this out there to other people. Um, we'd love to put on some workshops for contractors, realtors, because it happens all the time where people come in, they get a contractor, they're like, man, I wish I knew beforehand. So I think that's really important. We've got time we for one more quick question. <laughs> Barbara, has your organization ever worked with the Canadian Centre for Inland Waters in Burlington, Ontario? Uh, not directly. We've chatted with them in the past. We had some funding uh, through the Recreational Fisheries Habitat Enhancement Program, longest name in the world. Um, but uh, no, not. We will work with anybody. We love to collaborate. We love to share our materials. So we, you know, we that's kind of who we are. We just our capacity. We ra raise every dollar every year from nothing. We do not get any funding support. Um, so that's our biggest challenge, is having the ability to do more. But Barbara, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you.